Now we're bringing up our next speaker. This is Dr. C. Suzanne Cutter. And this session will be talking about understanding small cell lung cancer and are you at risk. Find out more about the disease of small cell lung cancer as our next medical expert will share the latest advancements in diagnosis and treatment. Learn how we're making progress against this challenging disease through a presentation by Dr. C. Suzanne Cutter. Dr. Cutter is the president of the Charles R. Drew Medical Society, the Los Angeles affiliate of the National Medical Association, and she is a co-moderator for a Meet the Black Doctors event right here in Los Angeles. So without further ado, let's welcome Dr. C. Suzanne Cutter. All right, good afternoon, everyone. So, you know, I wanna thank you all for uh, joining us today and being a part of this event. Uh, I think this is very important. You know, we were talking backstage about health and what it takes to get people's attention about their health. So I'm glad that so many people really do care about it. So we're gonna jump into the slides. Uh, I've already been introduced, I'm not gonna dwell on this, but in addition to uh, the Charles R. Drew Medical Society, I'm also an associate professor at Charles Drew University. I also uh, chair, uh, that's right, new HBCU Medical School here in town. This is the fourth HBCU medical school in the country, the only one west of the Mississippi, so we should be very proud of that and really support the university. That's right. And then I also chair CME at Dignity Health. Okay, so I don't have any financial disclosures, so we're gonna jump in. This is a little bit of a, uh, uh, it's a little technical, but I think you guys can handle it, okay? I, I, I think you can handle it, so we're gonna go through some things. And I just wanna keep the slides on the screen, so I'm gonna start off, we're gonna talk about lung cancer. You know, lung cancer is the number one cancer killer in the US, right? And, you know, unfortunately, black men suffer from lung cancer disproportionately. And what that means is black men are a certain percentage of the population, but they're more likely to get lung cancer. And in fact, black Americans in general are more likely to be diagnosed at an early stage. I'm sorry, they're less likely. And they're less likely to receive surgical treatment, which is what I do, is surgery and they're less likely to receive any treatment when compared to white Americans. So one of the important things about talks like this and getting this kind of information is that you can help to end these disparities. I'm gonna give you a little technical data here. So this is a, a bar graph and you can see the different bars on the right side of the screen, but you can see that it says early diagnosis, surgical treatment, lack of treatment, and survival, and this is a comparison between black Americans and white Americans. The bottom line here is that black Americans with lung cancer were 15% less likely to be diagnosed early, 19% less likely to receive surgical treatment at all, so that means even if it's indicated, 20% of the people are not gonna get it because nobody's gonna offer it, right? Which, if you know what you need, then you can ask for what you need, okay? That's the point of that. And then 10% more likely not to receive any treatment. So that means no surgery, no medical therapy, and no radiation therapy, so that's no good. And 12% less likely to survive five years. And we're gonna talk about survival rates in a moment. So I wanted to dig a little bit deeper into these disparities. And so if you take a look at this graph, the key thing to look at is the blue bars, right? So if you look at the first group of bars, that's early diagnosis. What this shows is that white Americans are more likely to be diagnosed early. That's the navy blue bar, okay? But in the second one, surgical treatment, it's Asians that are more likely to get surgical treatment. That's the bright green bar. Lack of treatment, it's Hispanics. They're more likely to have a lack of treatment. That's 26%. And then in the far right, I was a little surprised by that, but the best survival is with Asian Americans. Unfortunately, African Americans lag in all of the groups except for the lack of treatment. So it's a good thing that we aren't the worst in terms of lack of treatment, but it would be better to have better treatment and outcomes. So a lot of people say, well, hey, how do I know if I'm at risk for lung cancer? Well, here are some of the risk factors. Air pollution, it's hard to do anything about that, right? You know, we live in the city. Radon, so that's why they have those radon detectors in homes now in large buildings. 
diesel exhaust, asbestos. Asbestos isn't only in the ceiling tiles, sometimes it's in the floor tiles, and it's in the plumbing. So if you buy a new home or a new building, make sure you have it checked for asbestos. Other chemicals, believe it or not, cleaning products are a big issue. That's one of the reasons I converted my home from the regular cleaning products you get in the store to special products that I can only get online. What we get in the stores, it's very toxic to the lungs. There's actually some studies that show that using that every week is equivalent to smoking. So we have to be careful about these things that we don't really think about all the time. Genetics, we can't really do much about the genes that we have, but we can do a lot about gene expression. So your habits can change the way your genes express, and you can improve that. And then also, a big culprit is secondhand smoke. You may not be a smoker, but maybe you love a smoker, and you spend a lot of time with a smoker. Every time you're sitting in front of them and they're smoking, you're breathing in the worst smoke, right? Because that's not filtered. So that puts you at risk. So I think it's good to know these risk factors. And in fact, it's not just lung cancer that tobacco use can cause. These are the other cancers, liver, stomach, you know, a whole lot of them. And because I also focus on obesity medicine, I like to talk about obesity. And I was a little surprised to find that lung cancer is not one of the cancers that is a risk in terms of uh, obesity, so that's a good thing, but there are 13 other cancers that are risks for obesity. Okay, so let's talk about lifetime chance of getting lung cancer. One in 16 men and one in 17 women are, have a likelihood of getting cancer, especially those who smoke. And then we already talked about black men are about 12% more likely, and the rate is about 16% lower in black women than white women, which is good. Unfortunately, these rates are coming together. In other words, that it's getting better for men and a little bit worse for women. So we have to be careful about that. Okay, so let's talk about the different types of lung cancer. So this may be a little busy, but I'm gonna explain it to you. On the left side is all of lung cancer. So you see the blue, that's non-small cell lung cancer, and the yellow, is small cell lung cancer, all right? So we're gonna blow up the blue, and that's what's on the left, I'm, excuse me, on the right of the screen. That's all the different subtypes of small cell lung cancer. So the most common type is adenocarcinoma, and we see adenocarcinomas in the breast, in the stomach, in the colon. That's one of the most common types, and it just describes a cell type. So if you know someone who gets a diagnosis and they say, oh, it's an adenocarcinoma, at least you've heard this term before, and you're gonna have some familiarity with it. It's important to just start to hear these terms become familiar. But adenocarcinoma is the most common type of non-small cell lung cancer. In terms of small cell lung cancer, there are two main types, oat cell and combined cell. So that's all you really need to know, two types of that. All right? All right. So here's a little quick comparison. The reason why they call small cell lung cancer is because why? The cells are small, yeah. <laughs> so the, the reason why they focus on that is because those are more aggressive cancers. And when we say more aggressive, that means they're more likely to do what? To spread, exactly, she got it. So they're more likely to spread throughout the body. Whereas the non-small cell lung cancer isn't quite as aggressive. The small cell lung cancer is so aggressive that it doesn't have four stages. It has two. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, you think of everything as being stage one, two, three, four. That's what non-small cell is. Why? Because you can treat at all of those stages. But small cell lung cancer is so aggressive, it only has two stages, and that is limited and extensive. So either you have a little, and they can try to treat you, or there's a whole lot. All right? Okay. See, I knew you guys could get all of this. It isn't too hard. <laughs> so here are some symptoms. Early symptoms include things like a chronic cough, pain in the chest, shortness of breath, unexplained weight loss. You know, some people start losing weight and they're feeling good and they're looking good and they're thinking, ooh, it's finally working after 20 years of eating my fast food and everything, I'm starting to lose weight. If you're not trying to lose weight and you lose weight, it is a cause of concern. Tell your doctor, hey, look, I've lost about 15 pounds and I can't figure out what happened. It's an early sign, and actually, it will help you to get treatment earlier. 
you don't want the late signs. Late signs are pain in the back and the hip. That means the cancer has gone where? To the bone, okay? Swollen lymph nodes in the neck or the collarbone. Nervous system issues like seizures or loss of balance. The, that means the cancer has gone where? To the brain, okay? And then things like yellow skin or yellow eyes. Cancer's gone where? To the liver. Somebody over here is really good. <laughs> Excellent, excellent. So the initial evaluation is what, you, what happens to you every time you go to the doctor, right? You go in, they do a physical exam and a history. I have to take a pause and talk about history. You know, sometimes people come to see me, so I'm a, a kind of a super specialist, so you have to be referred to come and see me. And they come and see me and say, oh, okay, hello, you know, what brings you here today? And they're like, I don't know. <laughs> like, how can you not know why you're here to see the cancer surgeon? You know, like you should know why you're there. And then I say, well, what kind of medical problems do you have? I don't know, it's in my records. How can you not know what your medical problems are, what your surgeries are, what your medications are, if your allergies? I may have somebody else's note, but what if they wrote it down wrong, right? What if they didn't send it to me before your visit? So what I tell people, if you don't like talking through all of that, just get out a piece of paper one day or open up your computer, record these things, past medical history, past surgical history, all of these things so that when you come see someone new, they say, well, what kind of medical problems do you have? You can just say, what? Bam, here's my page, right? You can make a copy, give me the original back. And then that way you don't have to have that conversation. It's all right there. And they're gonna respect you more and it's gonna increase the likelihood that you're gonna get the standard of care. Probably shouldn't be that way, but I'm just telling you how it is, all right? So that's just a word about that. They'll do some labs, they'll get a chest X-ray, and that's a little image of getting a chest X-ray in the lower right. So once there's a high suspicion that maybe there's a lesion there, they usually go on with a CT scan, and then they'll do a biopsy. So these are non-surgical biopsies, and I'm gonna show you three. The first one is a percutaneous biopsy. That's when they take a needle through the skin into the tumor, using imaging, and then they send that to the pathologist. The next approach for lung cancer is to take a, a scope, a camera, down through the mouth, into the throat, into the lung area, and take a look at the airways. If they see a tumor, they will get a biopsy of what they see, or they'll rinse it out with fluid and send that to pathology. And then the third way is to do what's called an endoscopic ultrasound. That means put in a, the same little kind of camera, but this one's a little different. It has an ultrasound probe on the end and a little needle, and they could take a biopsy of what they see, not just in the airway, but adjacent to the airway if there's a lymph node or something like that. Now, the good news is they usually sedate you for this. You don't have to be awake and get a... <laughs> You know what I mean, <laughs> usually. <laughs> but if they don't, ask, say, hey, look, I, could you please sedate me for this? I can't, you know, <laughs> that's a bit much, isn't it? Okay, so now let's talk about why are we doing all this? Why are we doing x-rays and all this kind of stuff? It's for staging, okay? We wanna know how much disease is there because knowing how much disease is there tells us how to treat it. So staging is determined by three things. T, N, M. T is for tumor. N is for nodes, you guys are good, and M is for? That's right. So anyone who has uh, any metastasis, that's automatic stage four. Does stage four automatically say someone's going to die? It used to, but not anymore. Now it means that, hey, we have to do more aggressive treatments. There's more things we have to look into, more investigations. So it's important to really realize that, okay? All right, so here's the staging system kind of laid out for you. Localized is stage one, when it's very focal. Anything that's in stage two or three, it's more regional, you know, some lymph nodes, a larger tumor. And then stage four, we already talked about, okay. Another way of helping with staging, or if you've already started treatment, is something called a PET-CT scan. And again, I'm just telling you this so that if you have to hear it again, at least you've heard it once, okay? It's good to hear things like one time so that at least you're familiar. But the PET scan is a combination of a study that shows the anatomy and a study that shows the function. And those two married together tells us how much tumor there is in the body. So you can see the image on the far right. The person has their hands elevated and the big black spot at the top, that's the brain, right? And you can see the spine down the middle and you see a little red arrow that shows that one little tumor in the lung. 
So that shows us that that probably is a cancer and it allows us to proceed with treatment. Okay. Okay, so let's talk about surgery. My favorite part of the talk, because I'm a surgeon. <laughs> So I'll start off by letting you know that there's a lot of different treatments that we give now. You know, it used to only be, you know, here's surgery and that's it. Then somebody developed chemotherapy and chemotherapy, which is, you know, wipe everybody out, everybody's sick, losing hair and everything. But now look at all these treatments that we have. So I tell people, you know, when you give them a diagnosis, sometimes people say, I don't want any chemo. Like you, you don't know that, you know, you don't know if you want chemo or not because you don't know what kind of chemotherapy they're gonna offer you. And in addition to that, you may not need chemotherapy, you might need immunotherapy. Immunotherapy is very targeted, there's very few side effects. Hormonal therapy, same thing. There's also radiation, there's targeted therapy. Do you see all these treatments we have available now? So the reason why I tell people about this is let's take the fear out of cancer. Let's go and make sure we get treatment as early as possible because the earlier you get treatment, the more likely you are to get what? cured, okay? All right, so who treats lung cancers? Well, surgeons do. I'm a surgical oncologist. I treat some lung cancers. Thoracic surgeons do the more extensive surgeries. Radiation oncologists, that's the one that gives the radiation that goes from outside the body and targets something inside. Medical oncologists, that's the one that gives things in the veins and you take pills by mouth. Different types of chemotherapy and immunotherapy. The pulmonologist also helps out because they're a lung specialist. Actually, one of the last speakers was a pulmonologist, Dr. Hawkins. Okay, so now we're gonna do a little anatomy. You didn't think you would have like a little class, did you? But we're gonna do a little class here. So in the middle of the screen, you can see the trachea and that's the airway, right? But that branches off to the left and the right. On the right side of the patient, now keep in mind, you're facing it, so the right's on your left, so this is right. So on the right side, there's three lobes in that lung, and then on the left side, there's two lobes in that lung. Why are there only two lobes on the left? Because what else is over in your chest on the left side? That's right, see you guys know anatomy. I didn't have to teach you this, you already know this. This is great. And then in addition, there's lymph nodes. Do you see all those little beans all over the place, the little green beans, those are lymph nodes. This is the anatomy that we focus on when we're trying to do our diagnoses and understand and do our staging. Okay, so you've seen it once. And again, when somebody else shows you again, you're like, I know about that already, I've seen it. So when we do different types of surgeries, we do different extents. So we can do a little bit, which is called a wedge resection, go on to a segment, which is part of a lobe. We can take an entire lobe. Again, there's three on the right, two on the left, or we can take the whole lung, okay? all three lobes on the right, both lobes on the left. So those are the different types of surgeries. And then the approach that we take, we can do open, that's the big incision, a VATS, which is with a camera, I'll show you pictures of that, and also we can use the robot. So here's open surgery. If anybody's grossed out by anatomy, you can close your eyes for the next three slides because I'm gonna show you some real life stuff. But uh, that's uh, making an incision, we have to put in a big retractor. And you know that kind of surgery works fine, but the problem is it's painful afterwards and it takes a while to recover. So somebody came up with a way to use cameras. So we use cameras and scopes. We make just tiny incisions. You see how small the incisions are there? They're about this big. And you can see on the right side of the screen, there's video monitors. That's where we can see what we're doing. It's like playing a video game. It's hand-eye coordination. And then at the very bottom, it shows a stapler at the tip of the lung stapling off the problem. So that's a really nice way to have a surgery if you can. And then the other way is using this robot. I showed a, show a picture of the robot in the lower right corner. It's got those three parts. It's got the arms, which looks like a standing tall kind of, a, what, a spider? Maybe in the middle is the tower with the video and all the controls. And on the right is the console. And you can see a surgeon with his face in the console booth and you can see the images on the screen. Okay, so that's enough uh, gross anatomy and everything. You can, you can open your eyes. <laughs> so let's talk about outcomes. What happens after all of these things happen, all of this treatment and everything? Well, we take a look and we assess it by survival rates. And what does that mean? From today until five years from now, how many out of 100 people are going to live after they've had treatment? So that's what we mean by survival five years survival. 
So you can see with non-small cell lung cancer, if it's localized, 65% will still be living. That's not bad. And if it's metastatic, about 9%. That's not quite as good. But overall, it's about 28% five-year survival rate with non-small cell lung cancer. So that's why it's important to get it diagnosed as early as possible, okay? However, small cell lung cancer, not quite as good. Only 30% if it's just localized. So that shows you how aggressive it is. And then overall, only 7% in five years. So, you know, it's not the best lung cancer to have. So the earlier that you present, the better. Okay, so let's summarize now. So these are some just key points about lung cancer. It's the leading cause of cancer deaths. Smoking causes a risk. Screening high-risk individuals can really help. And there are multiple types of lung cancer to know in terms of small cell lung cancer. You know, this is one that's very aggressive. There are two types. Smoking is the biggest risk factor. Signs and symptoms of small cell lung cancer include coughing, shortness of breath. There's testing for that. Certain factors uh, affect prognosis. And then for most patients, treatments that we have available today, not as successful as other cancers. I wanna draw your attention to this. You can take a picture of this screen, but this shows the American Lung Association. They really want to encourage black Americans to get into clinical trials. My mother's best friend had leukemia. She had a bad leukemia, it was spread all over the place. They couldn't cure it with the regular stuff. She got into clinical trials. She survived 10 years, 10 years. And she went through multiple trials. And she didn't even die of that. She got breast cancer during that. She survived breast cancer. And then something happened you know, with another part of her body and she actually died as a result of that surgery. But she survived leukemia for 10 years on trials. So trials are not a bad thing. So really look into that. Okay, so I wanna give you some action items because you know, for me to give you all this information, you're like, well, what am I supposed to do now? I think it's helpful to know what do you do now? So I have three key tips. One is to ask questions. Two, take notes. And three, honor yourself. And that's one of my acronyms, and I'll tell you about all of those. So there is a great series of questions that you can find on the American Cancer Society website, and they take you through the different phases of treatment. So when you're told that you have lung cancer, you say, well, what kind do I have? Will I need other tests? Do I need to see another doctor? And then when you're deciding on treatment, how much experience do you have with this type of cancer? You know, what do you recommend and why? What are my chances that cancer will be cured? So these are some of the questions here. During treatment, how will I know if the treatment is working? How can I reach you? Or what symptoms or side effects should I tell you about right away? And then the final stage is after treatment. Are there any limits on what I can do? What kind of symptoms should I look out for? How will we know if the cancer has returned? So these questions will help you to have a better conversation with your doctors and with the people that you're working with so that you can get the information that you need. And this goes across all cancer types. So take a look at that website. The next tip was take notes. I don't know why people come to talk to somebody who has all this technical information, they don't write anything down, you know? We can barely remember, no, I'm kidding. No, but it, <laughs> we had to study for years and years. You know, I trained for nine years to be a surgeon. I spend 30 minutes explaining to you, do you really think you're gonna understand and remember all of that? No, so take notes. And so there's a little form here. So you include the doctor's name, the date of the visit, the reason for the visit, diagnosis and treatment, follow up, and then some other notes that you may have. If you do that for every physician visit, I trust me, you will be very well aware of what's going on. And then the final slide, I don't have time to really go through this in detail, but this is what I teach my patients, and it's on my website, but it's, I call it Honor Yourself, H-O-N-E-R-R-E. -R -R -E. Hydration, organ detoxification, nutrition, exercise, rest, relationships, environment. And the two things that trip people up are what? Relationships, see, you knew it, you knew it, right? So you can't change the other person, but what can you change? How yourself, how you respond, and your attitude. That, why, why, do you, why do you do that, why? What's the benefit? Yes, it brings your stress level down, but why does that matter? It decreases something called cortisol. Cortisol is your stress hormone. It takes your immune system off the map. 
If your immune system isn't working, you're not fighting cancer. And if you're not ca fighting cancer, cancer's winning. You want to be calm, at peace, namaste, you know, <laughs> do whatever you want. You know what I mean? When people say things, crazy things to you, you're like, do whatever you like, namaste. I'm going to go out and take a walk in the park. So keep that in mind. And then environment is everything around you. So it's everything from your toiletries, you know, your lotions, cosmetics, things like that. So that's why my patients always ask me, what can I use? So I, I do a health and wellness overview with them. And then I turn them on to this website where they can order things that are non-toxic, no thalines, no parabens, no chloride, no ammonia. It's cleaning products, it's protein products, so many wonderful things to get all of that stuff off of your skin. So when I wash my clothes, it's in that type of thing, so I'm not leaching those chemicals into my body. So keep that in mind, just in terms of your health overall. Okay. So here are some resources. If you have your cameras out, this is a great photo to take because these are all the websites to take a look at. American Association for Cancer Research, American Lung Association, National Cancer Institute, American Cancer Society, and National Comprehensive Cancer Network. And of course, my website, curatology.com. All right, everyone. So that's it for today. And I'll be happy to answer questions if there's time. Thank you. Hello. Okay, thank you. Yes. Hello. Okay, we have Hi. some raffle prizes. We're... I'm... Hi. Oh, Hello. one question. question. We have yeah. a question. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. This is, I'm Jacques Talaferro with La Hitch Television, and I appreciate this conference. I've been covering conferences like this about maybe 20 years, and I'm, again, I'm elated that the conference is here, but I'm kind of taken aback that over 20 years of hearing similar things, not enough progress has been happening. So this particular panel has interest to me because I'm out of San Francisco, but I'm here in LA shooting a film on uh, my uh, cousin and artist, uh, Coolio, who died about a year and a half ago. And the director of the film was our other cousin, Malik Slaughter, who also is a pretty known actor. And he just died last week of lung cancer. So, um, that really has touched the family, but we're still going on with the film. Right. Uh, I really applaud you, you got Martin Luther King, um, and I've been there before, and I was, I, I was taken aback at the lack of black professionals that were working there, and I actually told the staff there that, uh, so I don't know what you can do about it, having more black professionals there, uh, but I would like to see that. Uh, so I didn't stay there because I met, needed medical attention. So I went to another prestigious hospital. And the thing there is they didn't hardly have any black professionals there either. But they have a lot of black um, kids on their team uh, making billions of dollars for them running around on the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the courts and the fields. Right. Uh, so I would like to see a lot of recruiting of, you know, they go to the ghetto and get our black kids to do that. I would like to see them go and get um, healthcare professionals. Out Let's of talk neighbors. about that. Can we talk about that? Uh, Can we talk about that? Yeah. You know, so this is no, a no, very, so, this is a very important topic that you're bringing up is the representation of African Americans in medicine. Okay, so we've heard about STEM, right? Yeah. And then what did we do to dummy down STEM? We started calling it STEAM. Right? So that the focus is no longer on science. We could put the arts back in there. And I'm not saying the arts isn't important, but it is. But getting people to get into STEM and everything, that's a challenge. Now, what happens next? They get into it and they start going through school. And they go to their counselor. What does their counselor say? You're never going to be a doctor. You're never going to be a lawyer. You can't be an engineer. Okay? So that's the next thing. But if you make it through that gauntlet, Okay, now somehow you make it into college. And guess what happens there? You're never gonna go to medical school. You can't get into law school. You can't get an MBA, right? Then you make it through that gauntlet. And then what happens after that? You're in your MBA school, you're in medical school, you're in law school. What do they tell you then? You can't find a job. We don't have a job. You know what, I'm, this is what's happening. So it's not like people aren't trying to recruit. What we have found and I'm speaking now as president and chairman of the board 
of the Charles R. Drew Medical Society, the Los Angeles affiliate of NMA, what we have found is that there are concentrated attacks on physicians. They are dismissing mm -hmm. our residents mm -hmm. at a rate somewhere around 13% of all of the dismissals are African American, but they only make up 4% of all the residents. That's three times the rate of their representation. Same thing is happening in the hospitals. You may have privileges today, but they start saying, well, let's, let's target you, Dr. Jones, and they start using peer review and some other mechanisms in order to get you out. So this is an ongoing problem, and I think the public needs to be aware, that's why I'm mentioning it today. There will be some legislation, there are standards that may be written, but we need your support as the public when these things come to the ballot or they become issues in the community for you to speak up. So you bring up some very important points. Now, you mentioned MLK. Who ran, who took, who restarted MLK, do you know? I, I don't know, but- UCLA. Okay. So who's UCLA going to put in there? A exactly. Enough said. Okay. So, um, Booker, <laughs> Booker T. Washington, and the T is for Talaferro. So as a Talaferro, we're looking to bring Tuskegee West here. I didn't know that you were associated with a black university, so that's a great thing. And I look forward to working with you on bringing Tuskegee West here. Thank Excellent. You. Thank you. Was I too controversial? I hope not. But we have to be honest. We have to be honest, right? Okay, any other questions before I take my leave? I just wanna thank you all, I enjoyed it. Have a good day.